interview. Yes. Okay. We're good? We're rolling. No. Rolling. Come on. Ready? What? So soon? Sorry. <laughs> All right. Wake up more. All right. Okay, guys. So again, jump in. This is very, very casual, okay. conversational. Like yeah. <laughs> uh, An answer been, to your non question. We, we've been here for two nights, and the audience reaction to you guys is just absolutely extraordinary. People have flown in from London, they've come in from Minnesota. So, like, can you talk about your unbelievable relationship with your audiences? No. <laughs> Some of us. My can. wife is over there. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's leaving. <laughs> we do have uh, great, great fans. Uh, probably not not millions of them, but they're absolutely rabid. People who uh, like what we do are just tenacious about it, and they'll uh, travel great distances and spend exorbitant amounts of money and uh, do all sorts of things to come and see us. This is kind of an exception, you know, because of the circumstances, the live CD and sure, and kind of, you know, Joe's swan song too. Um, so it's, it is somewhat unusual to have people coming, you know, from Minnesota to Ontario or from, uh, you know, from England. Although actually one, yeah. of the, one of the couples here from England uh, about a year and a half ago flew over uh, to Rochester to hear us play. Just flew over, you know, on a, was, on a Friday. It was his, his birthday, and right. her, her present to him for his birthday was a, a flight over. Yeah, and they just flew over for the concert and stayed, you know, two nights and then, and then flew back. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm planning to, like, rejoin the band next week and then quit, <laughs> quit again next year. <laughs> <laughs> just do that every year. We're going to yeah, do another yeah, farewell yeah, tour. Yeah. We um, wouldn't be the only band that does that, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Who were you thinking of? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell, we interviewed a whole bunch of people, and Joe, I have to warn you and your significant other that there are a couple of women out there who want to tear you limb from limb. It's really... Uh-oh. Oh, you know? us too. This is frankly <laughs> puzzling to the rest of us. <laughs> they think you're just you the greatest thing <laughs> in the world. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's really... Uh, how do you feel about, about leaving? Well, it's... <laughs> sort of two ways at once. I mean, I'm, I'm really going to miss the performance and uh, the camaraderie, the creative energy. Uh, you know, what a great bunch of guys to work with. On the other hand, I'm not going to miss the 14-hour car rides, and uh, that's really what's, uh, <laughs> what's going against me right now. I'm getting to that age where, you know, two hours in the car, and I get out, and I feel like I'm, you know, 87 instead of 57, so... Um, I'm definitely, definitely not going to miss that aspect. I'm going to have to, I mean, I'll find creative channels for my creative energy. Um, like writing songs for us. Yeah, like writing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got many projects in mind. I just hope that I can, uh, you know, like, <laughs> engage myself in activities that don't involve too much travel. My, my greatest fear is that I'm going to end up traveling more out of the band than I was with the band, so. <laughs> That's kind of our fear, too, because, <laughs> uh, I mean, Joe's always been the central part of this band. For a long time, his voice was the defining part of the sound, you know, back in the early days. Yeah, you know, why did we get I rid of that on. aspect? Yeah. Huh? Uh, <laughs> we wanted to rely more on your fiddling. Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> No, but I came along and Al came along and the, and the, the, the singing became somewhat decentralized, you know. But, yeah. but I mean, there, there, is this, there is this odd sense in which we're now going to be our, we're suddenly going to be our own tribute band because <laughs> there's nobody left anymore who's original, you know. I mean, I've been around 15 years and that's a long time, but, but we, we had a, uh, back when we had a, a booking agent in the States a couple of years ago, and, and uh, she phoned me one day and said she'd been talking to a presenter who had heard some rumor, and this is some time ago, but he, more than a year ago, heard some rumor that Joe was going to be leaving. And he said, well, if he's not in the band, they're not coming. I don't want them. So. Yeah, know. but it, it's okay. You know, like, all, all the originals now will regroup <laughs> as a rival band. Yeah, call themselves Tanglefoot. No, we're just going to, no, we're going to call ourselves Tang. 
You guys can be the goal foot. <laughs> and we'll challenge you to a game of football. <laughs> and, and then a double bill concert. That, yeah. You haven't been thinking about this, have you? Not too much. No. Okay, no, I didn't think so. <laughs> I want to flip it over to Brian, Terry, and Al. How, how do you feel about sort of the, the last original member taking... Hold on one second. I mean, yes. How do you feel about this, boys? <laughs> well, it's about time. <laughs> That's what I thought! <laughs> you jerk! <laughs> you know, I think uh, we've talked a lot about the sort of the philosophy of the group and where the kind of the center is in terms of the kind of music that we're doing. And Joe has always been a real important aspect of that, saying, you know, that he didn't want to get too far afield, like, because we have a pretty far range, a big gamut of kind of styles now, of things that we do. But we always are really conscious of the center, and I think that's something that we'll still maintain, even without Joe. So I'm, I'm still looking positively at it. I don't, I don't think that we're really losing him, not entirely anyways. He's still going to be a mentor to the group, and, you know, it, it, it'll still go on, and he'll still be a part of it. And I think we'll still keep that kind of focus, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a sufficiently well-defined uh, entity in terms of the vision of, of what we're about and that's not going to change you know we're we're still going to be what what we and what other people expect Tanglefoot to be and we've all and, and in other person I mean we've had a lot of personnel changes and we've always managed to make those changes with people who came in sort of seeing it the same way that we that we see it and uh, and I, I'm that's going to continue in the world of folk music, I know it's a varied world. Where does Tanglefoot fit in in the world of folk, in the world of Canadian folk music? That's a good question. We're often, uh, I think, trying to, to figure that out ourselves, just what it is, what it is that we do. And I think part of that, that's, that's double-edged, because uh, what we do is, is different enough that I think it makes it really interesting to a lot of people but it's also uh, kind of hard to, to pigeonhole. And sometimes, I mean, just the word folk music, I think conjures up pictures of, oh, I don't know, you know, Peter, Paul, and Mary, or, or you know, something that is definitely not us, although somewhere I suppose it's, you know, it's part of our roots. But, uh, but as for, for where we fit in, I think it's, uh, well, it's certainly at the loud end of things. There was a review of the last CD of Agnes on the Cowcatcher in the Toronto Star, and the guy said it's it's art. He said it's art songs disguised as reproduction folk, and that's really what it is. They actually are art songs. You know, they're intended to survive many listens. They're intended to be kind of, for the most part, they're intended to be kind of multi-layered. You know, both in terms of lyrics and and in terms of you know a rich enough musical accompaniment that it keeps you listening, and. It's, so it's that done in a somewhat traditional style with you know, traditional musical motifs. So you know, in that sense, I guess it fits into the folk music genre because of the instrumentation and because of the, uh, of the sound. But we've always wanted to do things, uh, well, I should say, since I always increasingly wanted to do things, but you know, once we get into the phase, you know, back in the late 80s and early 90s where we were writing a lot more than doing real traditional stuff, we always wanted to do stuff that it was just that little bit more interesting, you know, and... Uh... Um, years ago, when, nearly 25 years ago, when we were putting Tanglefoot together, um, my hope at that time was to become sort of the Gilles Vigneault of, the, of English speaking Canada. In other words, a, a folk poet in the sense of someone who was uh, dipping into the folklore history, but also the hopes and aspirations and feelings of everyday people in our society. So, and that, that and was sort of my original vision of the of the band. Yeah, and I think that's what it, that's what it has become. If you look at you know some of the body of the material, especially you know the stuff that Joe's written, it's very much like that. You know, song like songs like Emmeline or like Crashing Down. You know, they very much are that, based on some sort of you know bit of anecdotal history, but they it, do extend into the you know the universal experience a little more, and uh, and and I think that's what keeps you know when you know going back to you're asking earlier about the audience, I think that's what keeps people coming back. Like, I mean, there are people coming tonight who have been here all three nights, 
and some people who saw us last week in Oswego, New York, you know, so they keep coming back because I think the songs have, you know, legs for them. And it's a, it's a, a credit to the, you know, particularly to Joe, but to everybody who, who, everybody, who puts yeah. a lot of thought into making the songs as rich as they can be. On, and, and on the other hand, knowing when not to do that, knowing when it's just a big romp and that's all that's intended, you know. So. Yeah, you can you you can go you can go too far and, and over over tax an audience. Uh, so it is good to uh, just now and then do do something that that you don't have to think about a lot. You don't have to listen to every detail of the story. You can just sort of kick back and let your Although, let your hair go. My idea of ideal writing for that kind of thing is the song that you listen to on the surface level and you get like that and you get yeah. you know that's what you get is the surface level when when you take the cd home and listen to it for the 14th time <laughs> oh there's something else there below this level you know there's another layer under that so yeah. I, th I think that the, was, the best of our stuff is very much like that yeah it really is quite extraordinary what you guys are doing because you're singing about things that she's never heard people sing about, whether it's Buxton or Crashing Down or various parts of Ontario and Canada that people don't usually, and it's quite amazing that you're doing that. Well, there are a million stories out there. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, there's, this old, um, there's this old maxim in the newspaper business, you know, everybody has a story. And, and I mean, I've never been to journalism school, but I believe what they used to do is they used to send you out in the street and, they, and the assignment was pick somebody and get their story and come and write about it because everybody has something interesting to say. Well, well, I mean, when you started this band, it was because in, you know, Canadian history was something that people knew a lot more American history yeah. than Canadian history, you know. Yeah, we just we weren't felt that on TV and, and even in schools, Canadian history was getting short shrift. And kids, kids, in, you know, when I was a kid, they knew more about Davy Crockett than, you know, Isaac Brock. Or, and uh, so one of, the, one of the goals of the band originally was to bring Canadian history to people in a way that was really palatable. You know, mm -hmm. Pierre Burton, of course, was doing it in print, but we wanted to do it in music, so. You know, we're songwriters and entertainers first and foremost. At least that's how I see myself anyway. But... In the, in the more lofty sense, we're kind of mythologizers, I think, of just the Canadian experience, if that's not too, you know, hoity-toity a thing to say. No, but it, in a it, larger sense, I it, think that's what we're doing. It, it's true, because there are, I mean, there, it's, the little, it's the little incidents, you know, everybody knows that George Washington chopped down a cherry tree and couldn't tell a lie about it, you know, that's, it, yeah. it's one of those things, and, and we have we have stories that are every bit as good as that, but they just they just haven't got the press. Yeah. yeah. Brian, mm -hmm. you're a real newcomer in the group. Yeah, it's uh, just about been a year now. Yeah. Coming up uh, in June will be my my one year mark. What's what, eleven months yesterday? Yeah. What's yeah. it What's it been like to to slide in with all of the history and? And remember, we're all listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just tune them on. <laughs> Oh, it's 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 been amazing. Too, uh, <laughs> um, well, I've had a chance to to do some co-writing with Joe as well, and just um, it's just all the guys are wonderful songwriters, and it's been an excellent experience. Was it challenging to, given the friendships and uh, and you know the hours logged on the road together, to to come into that? I think it. it it all happened so fast that I didn't really have time to, to think about it. <laughs> it was we, fast. Yeah. yeah. It was um, a matter of hours of rehearsal that Brian had with us before we did our first gig. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it was, I think, three, three to four weeks before we were on the plane together. It was just, it just I just didn't have, have any time to, to really sit back and get nervous about it. Yeah. And, I think because Brian started in England, England is our most intense touring time of the year. When we're over there, we, we average about four or five shows a week for a six-week period. And, uh, you know, we're just all together all the time, and it was a really uh, mm -hmm. excellent that opportunity to, break in. Yeah, to get to know yeah. Brian and likewise to get to know us. Why does England love Tanglefoot? Mm 
What? You, you know, I, I was saying something earlier about this. Uh, I think we are exotic enough mm -hmm. that, that it's, it's interesting to them, but we're not so alien that it turns people off. We're, you know, enough rooted enough in the same traditions as, as the English folk scene. You know, the, yeah. the shanty singing kind of stuff, yeah. the big harmonies and the, and the storytelling songs. You know, that's a big part of what we do. Uh, but uh, so this is something that our, uh, our friends over there have said, is, is that there's, there's just nobody else who just gets out there and wails the way we do. Uh, so I think we, we sort of offer them a, a, a big, uh, big visual, energetic package. But at the same time, it's it's a kind of music that they uh, that they understand. I think it was Steve who said a couple of days ago that your popularity here in this in Toronto has just expanded exponentially. Well, when did we play for Lillian at, uh, the first time? I think that was it was it was March. I think that was two, two or three two years ago last March, and uh, it was a concert ser series that uh, Lillian Wothier runs, uh, uh, Fiddles and Frets. Uh, out in uh, um, in the beaches, yeah, out in the beaches, beach, yeah, yeah in, in a church hall. Now, previous to that, I don't think we'd ever. I mean, we played in Toronto. We played some big events, you know, like some harborfront stuff and some other things. But we'd not, for a paid ticketed audience, I don't think we'd ever drawn more than forty people. Uh, mm -hmm. And and suddenly, she, I think it was about three hundred, two hundred seventy-five. Uh -huh. So yeah. it just, it just, it was just tenfold mm -hmm. for no reason that that, I mean, that was not what we were expecting, and it actually was not what she was expecting either. But she couldn't have gotten another person in that church. It was, it was the biggest, single, most profitable night we've ever had. And, I mean, we made a fortune that night, everybody did. And, uh, but that was a really recent thing, and now we play in Toronto about every six or eight months and, and, and get nice big houses, and we've played for her since. We've played out at Hughes Room a couple of times to big houses, you know. I mean, there are tons of people here all this weekend. We're playing Hughes Room again in the, in the, uh, November. In the winter. So, yeah, there was this f funny thing, you know, about being like a 15-year overnight success in the city of Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> the songs you've chosen are, are really amazing and really wonderful. Um, do you think you can tell me, in not in any particular order, why some of them were chosen and why they made the cut? The, uh, the songs that were at the top of my list for, to go on the, the sets for the, for the live recording were the, the ones that always, always get big audience response. and. Uh, I mean, people just seem to like what we do in general, but there's some songs that, that night after night, uh, really, there, there's just, you can just feel a, a big surge coming through the audience at the end of them. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is uh, about, those, about those songs, but uh, you just notice it night after night. And uh, so there were... Our hits. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's what they are. We also tried to choose sort of songs that were representative of what we'd done over the years, so that they weren't just songs that we'd written in the last two years, for example. You know, we wanted to dig back a little bit into, into our past and bring a couple songs to the fore that we haven't been doing for quite a while. Yeah. But again, there were songs that got a good response at the time, so. It's no. really cool in that, like uh, there's one, Couple Township, I, I really like doing that one. It's something from the very first album. And the band's really progressed, obviously, so much from there to where we are now. But taking that song and then making a new arrangement of it is a really exciting process, mm -hmm. you know? And being involved in, even on that level is, is a wonderful thing. Yeah. And there's the usual thing we want to have as even a representation or, or as proportional a representation as possible of, you know, different singers doing the songs because we all sing, um, you know, different writers and, and, and you have to, it, it also has to work as a show, like a live show because yeah. the point of doing a live album is, you know, that you come in record what's already happening. So we've always put our live sets together with, a, with quite a bit of thought to the, just the contour of the evening, you know, like, you know, giving it some shape and, and, and taking people on a little trip and you settle them for a while and bring them back, you know, in high energy and low energy and ebb and flow and that kind of thing. So, so there was, all that went into it as well. So, and then hopefully at the end of it, we have <laughs> over three nights and, and uh, three, three, hopefully three uh, 
three takes to choose from of 22 or 23 songs or whatever it is, that uh, you know we've got enough to make a record out of it. How did the negotiation or the, the, the discussion take place? On, did you each bring a couple of songs to the table or how? We sat around a table. In, and, in Edmonton, and, Alberta, yeah. all day. And, and, uh -huh. But we went around the table and each person would get to pick a song, pick a song, pick a song, then we went around again. <laughs> And, and actually, at the end of that process, there was a very, you know, very little argument yeah. about. Uh, yeah. We just had a nice group of songs after we'd gone around the table a few times. I didn't have much of a list. I had about two songs because I, I just knew everything that, everything that I thought was going to be on there. I knew what, like one more night, you know. I thought, well, that's got to be on. It's been a big song for us forever. Um, you know, seven aside, it's been a big song for us for a long time. Well, I knew. Those are going to be in there. I didn't bother writing those down. There were one or there, there were one or two in particular that I wanted to kind of bring up, but but that's right. That's how I remember it too. There was there was very little dissension. I mean, there were, there was sometimes there was a lot of discussion about this instead of that, or well, we already have a song of this kind of ilk, you know. So do we need that? Is there room for that kind of thing? But it was. I actually I enjoyed that process a lot more than I actually thought I would, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I mean, we we had to. Not all that long ago, just a year ago, we'd have right. a meeting where we had to cut two songs from an album, and I mean that was bloodletting. You know, yeah. it sure was. It's, it was, yeah, it was tough after after spending a lot of time in the studio getting you know brand new songs and, uh, and finishing them and all. Finishing they were them all finished, yeah. mixed the whole thing, and they all sounded good. There were it yeah. wasn't like we could listen to them and say, oh well, you know that that really doesn't work. It doesn't sound very good. They all sounded good. And of course, that's part of the nice thing about choosing the songs for the live set, is that like, we've got tons of material, but I think it's all good. So it was it was hard to really really go wrong. It was more a matter of just what's what's writer. Yeah, right. <laughs> writer. The tough part I think now is going to be once this is all done, you know, is deciding what songs are really going to make the cut. Now some of it's going to be obvious because we're just not going to get a, a good enough up to standard take of some songs, so they'll probably just get chopped off right off the block, but the rest of it, we'll have to go through this democratic process again to, to sort of round it out and find the whatever, how many songs it is that we're going to put on this, this album, go on, you know. Yeah, and again, it's got to work as a, as, as a viable recording, it has to work too, you know, if, if, if all the songs that worked really well in the live recording are all the really fast songs and, and all the slower songs and the ballads and stuff, were all the ones that crash and burn. Well, that doesn't make for a very good recording, you know, because it's all just too one-sided. Who's ringing? <laughs> Who's that? When it's all said and done, the thing has to work as a CD, you know. It, if, if we get in a situation where all the songs that, that turn out to, uh, that we have good performances of at the end of the weekend are all the hot songs and the ballads have all gone to hell, well, you know, I mean, that's a problem because it's, it's got to balance out on the record as well. So, it, you know, it, it's, that's why you take three nights and that's why you do 22 songs, you know. So you've got lots of, as much flexibility as possible to make it not only good, but good and, 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 and balanced in terms of tempos and, you know, all that stuff we were talking about before. The, the other thing, too, that, that you reminded me of a minute ago was um, there is one brand new song that we are doing at least on, on the stage and, again, whether we'll it see. makes the cut or not, we'll see. But we did want to put uh, one new song in it. It's a bit of that, right? Yeah. yeah. Why, why? We had we had actually uh, recorded that for the uh, for the, the, the previous CD. Uh, CD, and it was one of the songs that we uh, that we cut. The first one. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was probably the easiest one to do because we were already thinking about doing a live recording, and it works better with an audience because there are just a bunch of chuckles in it and uh, it's, uh, it's a fun song to do and we're kind of hammy about it uh, in, our, in our presentation yeah, and yeah. That, that works so much better with an audience so we thought okay we'll just Believe not it. use the studio recording we'll just do it live. I'm going to switch tracks here for a second. Um, Joe, when the band is over in England touring away mm -hmm. and you're at home mm -hmm. What do you think you're going to be 
thinking about. Ah, you're gonna be thinking they're over there using my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna be thinking they're over there making lots of money to pay off my credit card. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a better way to look at it. <laughs> Well, I'm probably going to be thinking, oh, I better write something impressive so when they come back, I've got something to show them because I've sort of said, well, I'm going to keep writing for you. So, um, but what have you done lately? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what have you done for us lately, Joe? Yeah. Um, Get off the plane and drive to Denby, knocking on your door. Yeah. What do you got? Actually, probably what I'm going to be doing is a lot of carpentry work. I'm building a house up in the wilderness near Bancroft, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, most of my uh, most of my summer is going to be spent uh, and and fall is going to be spent with hammer, screwdriver. Uh, and next <laughs> summer but, and next fall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when did you start that house? Was it '64 uh, or something? <laughs> 1864. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you guys, a, a big, huge part of your professional life is on the road. Have there been wonderful moments, embarrassing moments, extraordinary moments? Can, does anything stand out? Yeah, Steve and I were, where was it, Kentucky or that, 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 that $10 motel we went to? And they, oh, uh, oh. Uh, no, it was... Um, Jackson, Tennessee. Tennessee, yeah, and, and uh, to, to get a room, you had to go into the sort of the bar or pool room, you know, and there's all these kind of... Badasses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, pickup trucks with gun racks, and the gun racks are empty because the guns are all in the bar. Yeah, know? and uh, we, said, uh, we said, are there phones in the room? And she said, no, they tore them out. They ripped them out, she said. Yeah, they ripped them out. She didn't say who they were. Yeah, we weren't, weren't sure, but... <laughs> There was it was the kind of place where you walked in and everybody went quiet. And, you and know. sure enough, we went into the rooms and there were just like, like ripped out wires hanging out of the wall. They literally had ripped them out. So it's, it's one of these places where you feel like you're in a movie just yeah. being there. You yeah. know? Didn't you say that the, when you guys were telling this story to me that you were thinking that everybody in the bar there was thinking about just a reason to kill you? <laughs> and yeah, whether yeah, they yeah, could get away with yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we, we were sitting in the hotel room watching TV and Joe says now, because all our gear was in the van and all our money was in, no, I guess the money was in the hotel room because we'd been on the road. So I had like $3,000 US in cash or something in the cash box. And, and <laughs> Joe says, so he says, if we hear somebody breaking into the van tonight, what do we do? Yeah. Like, do we go out? <laughs> and so, because we, we thought we should kind of decide ahead of time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> not make the decision at four in the morning. Yeah. I do think we, we decided we wouldn't. Do we, do we leave? Do we leave like fifty bucks out there so they'll all get something and then leave and us then alone, leave. or you yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> on on the other end of the of the scale for uh, for road stories, when we first played in Lunenburg at the Folk Harbor Festival, we're going to be back there again this summer. We uh, played that I don't know maybe seven or eight years ago. Yeah, it was 95, 1995. 95, and uh, we drove there. And our first show was at the old opera house, which is a funky old building with a dirt floor in the basement where the change rooms are. And so we were we were down there, kind of listening to the the noise from upstairs and whoever was on ahead of us and getting ourselves all ready. And then we came up the stairs and we were waiting in the wings, and they announced us. And this was this was the first time that we had ever been there, so we expected that nobody would know us. And uh, but. We came out onto the uh, onto the stage after they uh, they announced us, yeah. and the place just exploded. It was it was unbelievable. There were probably I don't know four or five hundred people in the place, uh, whatever whatever it would hold. It was just packed. Um, it's a well attended festival, and and the place just went wild. And and we, we weren't expecting that at all. No, it was, no. It was almost intimidating. It was just there was this yeah. this roar when we went out there, and we'd had a really crappy gig the night before. I remember. Oh we, yes. We played for like two and a half people or something. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, and it was, it's true. We were in Middle Muscadabat. Yeah. And yeah, something like that. Uh, I think we had to yeah. you know slug gear up to the third floor of some you know some theater and. Uh, this hadn't hadn't been great. And then, uh, yeah, and then this huge ovation, and, and then it continued. And it wasn't really because anybody knew us, because, it, no. you know, we had not been there. It was just they, we just, the music just really connected with the kind of audience that that festival uh, attracts. And the, and the whole rest of the weekend, uh, wherever we went in town, you know, people were stopping us and getting our autographs. It was like the real rock star 
treatment. Yeah. I mean, not just us. Like they're like a number of the other performers. You know, like Artisan. You know, yeah. from England and and Rollins Cross there and Garnet Rogers. And I mean, they're all getting this too. Yeah, but you, it's this wonderful treatment where you're just everywhere in town. You're a celebrity. You, you know, go for into that a weekend. Go into a restaurant. And people would stand up and <laughs> applaud. Clap. I know. Yeah, just, that's right. That yeah. happened the, the the time I did it with you guys. The uh -huh. second time. Yeah. Yeah. It was and, amazing. Yeah, and it, and it's still like that. We were down there a couple of years ago. We're going back this summer, uh, as well. And uh, if there's ever a place, you know, to to give you a, a huge burst of enthusiasm and 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 you know, stroke your ego and make <laughs> you feel good about your yourself as a band, it's it's Lunenburg Festival. It's, mm -hmm. it's a it, it's the first place where we really. It was the place actually where we decided that we should do this. We should give this a shot at doing it full time because I remember we were driving home after doing it the second time, and, and, mm. and you said, "Well, maybe we should, you know, think about just, you know, maybe now is the time." It was like the fall of '96, and it took two years to kind of organize everything. And, and I remember Joe said, "Maybe we should think about just trying to do this, you know, on a full time basis." And that was, it was after doing Lunenburg the second time. So Lunenburg's always been this kind of place we had a real affection for for that reason. You know, uh, uh, Kind of a watershed place for us. But we've had lots of like interesting road experiences. We've had, we've been locked out of our hotel. <laughs> we've been, we were oh, just because they didn't like us. <laughs> no, it was just because in England they go to bed at ten o'clock at night, and know. you know. Yeah, you can't get into a hotel necessarily yeah. at two in the morning, and nobody told us that yet. <laughs> we we played a gig somewhere in England where a fight broke out. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty really unusual for a folk club, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Two guys awesome. start wailing each other. Oh, we watched the police arrest a guy at gunpoint, like at the the very ne but the distance from me to Brian, uh, uh, at a gas pump and in you know Bowling Ohio, in Bowling Green, Ohio. <laughs> it just you, you'll. It was for shoplifting. Yeah, for shoplifting. Yeah, yeah. they take that pretty seriously yeah. down there. <laughs> but so absolutely <laughs> stunning. I remember the first time we ever played Huntington Hall in England. It's a beautiful, elegant, you know, uh, I believe a 17th century, well, it was a 17th century Methodist church, and there's now this wonderful concert hall where the ushers, you know, are in coat and tie and the white gloves and all that stuff. <laughs> and, they, and they have, among other things, they have a lot of folk music in there. Mm -hmm. And the first time we played there, we just thought we'd died and gone to heaven, you know? Everything's so classy and just wonderful. They treat you wonderfully. And yeah, but we also thought, like, nobody's gonna no, yeah, show up yeah. for this gig. Because, we yeah, the first tour of England, we'd never been anywhere near Worcester yeah. before, and we're thinking, well, this is gonna be great. Like, the sound check was just pristine, and we're thinking, this is gonna be wonderful. Who in the hell is going to come, you know? <laughs> but there were, there were a lot of people there. Yeah. Yep. We walked on stage and there was like, just people. <laughs> and to this day, I have no idea who they were or why they were there on, on that first tour. But they, they keep, uh, they keep, they, they they keep coming, coming back. back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the I last... think they buy into the series. It's just a, 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 it's a place with a good reputation. And if you're on their roster, yeah. that's it, you know? And that, some of that has happened for us with other mm -hmm. gigs where we've been, it's been a totally new place. And you show up the first time and you expect that you're not going to have a really good turnout. But if it's a really organized club or concert series or whatever, whatever you get an amazing turnout, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. just on the faith of the people that present it. I'll tell you about another gig that was really special and it was really unexpected, at least for me. Uh, I, I believe it was about two years ago. We were out in Edmond or playing out in Alberta and uh, a friend of ours who's a concert promoter out there named Brian Aramenko asked if we would come and play at the at the Canadian Legion branch where he's a member um, and because we had a night off and, and and he said you know you'll make come and stay at my place you know you'll make you know well you make more money than you will if you're not working and and we said well sure you know Brian's a great guy he's been very generous to us over the years and we thought well you know even if we wouldn't normally do something like a Legion you know we'll do it for Brian certainly and we kind of expected a bar gig because, you know, people are playing pool, drinking, watching the hockey game, you know. And, uh, but that's not what it was like. Like, everybody listened. They sat and listened. And we did songs like Old Broken Soldier and Vimy. I remember this guy came up to me afterwards and he, and he, and he said, uh, he, uh, he told me this story about, you know, being in France in the Second World War and having his, the drive, he was a communications expert and he had the driver of his Jeep shot right out from beside him. The guy was just obliterated by a sniper's bullet. And he said, I've never told anybody that story before, you know? And, and the, the kind of connections that we made with people that night were completely unexpected. And I was completely sandbagged. 
sandbagged by it. I didn't expect it at all. It was a wonderful night, and we've been back there since to play, and I expect we'll be back there to play again. It's the Jasper Place Legion, and, and that was a really special night, too, for me. And, and again, probably extra special because it was, like I say, an, uh, an unlikely sort of venue for us. Last night, it looked like you guys were having a lot of fun. Can you talk a little bit about that when it's real, everything is working, when the, the communication is good and you're just having a ball? Oh. Well, it's just, it's the best job in the world. You're up there with four other great guys and you're, you're making music and you've got a room full of screaming fans. It's, there's nothing like that. You know, it's, yeah. it's incredible. And so, you know, some rooms just happen to be better than others in terms of intimacy with the audience. And this is a really this great a really room because you can see everybody's face and you, you know, so you, you're feeding off that sort of facial energy that, <laughs> that you're getting back from the audience. It's great. Yeah, you get back probably more. Yeah. I mean, it's a big, phys you know, it's a physical, you know, draining kind of show, but you do get back more than you, than you put out. And, th and that's what makes the kind of special night like, you know, like you're talking about. And there, I mean, there are nights where uh, it's a little harder to do that because especially if it's a new audience, yeah. you know, and they're feeling you out and they're not quite yeah. sure what context to take you in. Like, um, you know, that sounded funny, but was it wasn't meant to be funny. You know, like that, it just, yeah. just things like that. An unfamiliar audience takes a while to, to just kind of settle in and warm up. The odd time you'll get uh, somebody you don't know sitting in the front row with a very impassive or even sour look on their face. Especially in New York. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, like, 95% of the time they'll buy a CD afterwards. Yeah, yeah or, and, or and, come and they up were just, after and, and it, talk about how good they, yeah, the show yeah. was. And they're just very intense listeners, you know, but they've got the knotted brow and they're sort of, mm. you know. <laughs> and you're thinking, what are we doing wrong? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when, we, when we started playing in England, our agent over there warned us, now, we, you know, when you, do, when you play in Yorkshire, you have to be prepared for a room full of people who would sit there and go, you know, and then at the end they go, that went all right, that. Yeah. And, 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 Which and means then, that's the best thing the yeah. world has ever seen. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that in Yorkshire is the same as what was here last night, you know, so. But when you're not expecting that, you after one song, you're thinking, what are we doing wrong? What? <laughs> They're staring. Don't they speak English? Yeah. Don't we speak English? <laughs> Was it a bizarre thought that a Tanglefoot CD was orbiting the Earth? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, that was, uh, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm exactly the right age to have been completely mesmerized by the Apollo space program, because I was nine years old when they landed on the moon. And I'm one of those people who can, I can remember all, remember where I was when this happened and that happened. And I even remember stuff before that, because when I was a little gaffer, I was really into it. So, for, like for me, finding out that one of our CDs was actually up in the space shuttle, and, and that gave, I could, I, was, I could tell myself I then had a personal connection with like, <laughs> space people, program. astronauts, <laughs> and people going up in rockets and yeah. going up into orbit. I was, I was just absolutely giddy with, like, with, like, with delight, you know? I was walking around like an idiot for days. Because <laughs> like, I was trying to stop people in the street. You'll never guess what, you know? <laughs> Who are you? Yeah. <laughs> Tell them a story about the, when you, when you told, you know, we do it as part of the introduction, you know, the, for one of the songs that, that are, uh, that one of our uh, CDs is oh. up in space. Oh, and we in were England? in England? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, before one of the songs, I would preface it by talking about the CD and, and the fact that Chris Hadfield, you know, took one of our CDs up with them on the space shuttle in April of 2001. And normally you hear this kind of, you know, this murmuring through the audience and sometimes a little applaud, you know, and, but there was dead silence. And a woman at the back said, no, he didn't. <laughs> and that was the only response. <laughs> and so, yeah, we, it was really hard to know <laughs> where to go from there. <laughs> well, moving on, you know. Uh, we'll be down to see you at the uh, break, madam. <laughs> It's so cool, like having Chris Hadfield come last night too with wow. his with his kids and and getting a chance to meet him and you know he was really into it and he was really really open and wonderful yeah, I experience. Bit, yeah, because yeah. he's a musician, he plays, you know, Rit rhythm guitarist like myself, <sighs> man and, after and, your own and a singer, heart. man after my own, a man who knows how to go yucka 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 for four and a half hours, you know, <laughs> in a band full of astronauts. They're all of what? Oh, 
His... No, not us. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're just space cadets. <laughs> yeah, that was a big thrill. That's great. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty close. Does anyone have any final questions? Do you guys have anything you want to say? Uh, you know, this is kind of a... This is Joe's last night as an official Tanglefoot member, and it's the last night of your CD. Any... It, for me, it's weird, because we've known this is coming for two years. I must say, I have this odd sense of disconnection from the actual event of Joe leaving, because I did my grieving, and, and, I, I, and that is a word I deliberately choose, two years ago. Except I'll probably start again. <laughs> Don't worry, we're all start right now. <laughs> Don't get me going. In about six and a half hours. So, uh, so uh, I, uh, it's odd. Yeah, I feel really detached from it too. I just can't believe that this is the last one. You mm -hmm. know, it's, and I think I think the thing is is probably because we've been so busy just trying to prep for the album and all the things that entail with that with the process. I don't think we've had an opportunity to really that's, express that's our exactly feelings right. really truly to Joe at this particular point. So I'm hoping that we'll, we'll be able to get together and do that soon, you know? But yeah, if but we do it now, guys, we'll None of you guys drink apart. anymore, so it's not going to be any fun. <laughs> <laughs> we can watch you drink. <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, I, I actually don't know how I'm going to feel on stage tonight. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden I may uh, just not be able to sing. I don't know. You know I, uh, As opposed just... to... <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> now you know why I'm <laughs> It's a good opportunity for song acquisition. <laughs> yeah. yeah, be ready to jump in. <laughs> I'll be right there. <laughs> Yeah, these guys will be dividing up my songs after the show. Oh, it was know, done months like ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was, eh? Yeah. I, th I think a number of those songs might just get retired. I mean, there are certain songs that... They're just Joe. That they're just Joe, and nobody else should do them, because largely because there's always going to be the comparison, the defining versions of songs. Uh, are often not, well, I mean, if you've never heard it done the other way, then it's fine. But if, if, you've, if, if somebody's gotten used to Joe singing, what, Keppel Township Love Song, yeah. and then, you know, and then I start singing it, well, there's always gonna be, I mean, we've been doing that song forever, there's always gonna be the comparison. Well, he does this differently, and he did, I like, he does that better, but he doesn't do that as well, or he doesn't do it as well at all. And probably most people who, anybody who really likes that song will not like it near as much with somebody else doing it. So, so in, 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 in some ways, I think the, the greatest honor is to, to the song is to, in some cases anyway, is to not do it. No more royalties. <laughs> no more residuals. Oh no, you still write all the songs everybody else sings, so you get lost. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, that's great. That's our yeah, a wrap. Oh, Darren's got one. Brian, as uh, as member, uh, when do you plan to get your uniform perfected? Mm -hmm. Practically bald. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was, I was keeping up pretty good with Joe, but uh... <laughs> he has a lot more hair than he did when we met him. Yeah, yeah I actually had a brush cut when I when I joined the band, so yeah, so it's coming in. Yeah. There's on, on our website. There's uh, one one of the pictures on the on the front page is a picture from Brian's first tour in England, and uh, and I I saw it just the other day, and I was surprised at, at how short his hair was because I had almost forgotten. But uh, yeah, I think I think he's coming right along. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you, have you ever seen a picture of your first tour with Tanglefoot? I did. Oh my yeah, that God. Was, that thing. was really scary. Yeah. Really? Talk about clean cut. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Hey. Nice.